Let's try that. Uh, now it's on. <laughs> All right, my friends, welcome. Let's get going. Go ahead and put your devices away, por favor. We're just going to get right to it. Announcements at the end. So I'm going to start off today, as we finish our, our series on how to think, with this. We've talked about this in the Racial Reconciliation Series, but it's appropriate here in that people are image bearers. End of sentence. They are not associations, positions, causes, or issues. And here's an example. We're going to look at associations. I want to introduce you to a man named Brian Stowe. In 2011, Brian Stowe was 42 years old. He was a firefighter in the Bay Area, and he was a big baseball fan. So he went to a game, his team won, and this is how he ended that day. So Brian Stowe was beaten into a coma. He lost part of his skull. It's amazing that he didn't die right there. These are the two men who, uh, Luis Sanchez and Marvin Norwood, who chose to take out their frustrations on Mr. Stowe. And here's the reason why. Brian Stowe is a rabid San Francisco Giants fan. The two assailants are hardcore LA Dodger fans. And Dodger fans and Giants fans don't like each other. And so Norwood and Sanchez took out their frustrations on a Giants fan. So here's the good news. He's still with us. He got a big settlement. Norwood and Sanchez are in prison. But his life is forever altered. He's not going to be a firefighter again. Um, daily tasks are, are difficult some of them impossible, all because he rooted for the other team. And when you say it out loud like that, it sounds ridiculous because it is ridiculous. But this is what happens when our thinking is not rooted in Christ. So today, we're going to talk about the problem of the terrible other. And what you will see is this continuation of the trends that we've talked about in this series and how it manifests itself in our thinking, in our actions, oftentimes without us really even being aware of it. This is a verse we looked at last week, and I highlighted the bottom part because it, it really is the, the core of what we're talking about here, to take every thought and make it captive to obey Christ. Thinking like Christ becomes the lens through which we see people, the filter through which we understand things. And if we don't, Here's an example of what happens. You can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. So rather than starting with the foundation of biblical truth and thinking from that, we start with our own flawed thinking. We add God to it. We find scriptures to prove what we believe to be true. And then we go forth and we act on it. And it happens very easily. It happens very quickly. It's very subtle, which is why we've taken time in these chapels to go, hold on, it matters how we think. It matters how we think because it matters how we then treat people. It matters how we act and how we move forward with that. I'm, uh, I'm going to read to you about someone that you probably don't know. Those are Christians. A few years ago, Megan Phelps Roper, a member of Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas, a church founded by her grandfather, Fred Phelps, decided to start using Twitter to spread the Westboro message. That message might be summed up by the statement most closely associated with Westboro Baptist, God hates fags. The church registered the URL godhatesfags.com all the way back in 1994. 
As Adrian Chen reports in his New Yorker profile of Phelps Roper, Twitter was a perfect venue for getting this kind of message across. Thus, this typical Phelps Roper tweet. Quote, thank God for AIDS. You won't repent of your rebellion that brought his wrath on you in this incurable scourge. So expect more and worse. But there was something Phelps Roper didn't anticipate on Twitter, which is that people talk back to you. When she began tweeting at a Jewish web developer named David Abadal, who, by the way, runs a blog called Julicious, this is what she said, quote, Oh, and at Julicious, your dead rote rituals do not equal true repentance. We all know the difference. Revelation 3.9. You keep promoting sin, which belies the ugly truth. So Abadal responded with bemused humor. He would later comment that, quote, I wanted to be, like, really nice so that they would have a hard time hating me, end quote. This kind of response threw Phelps Roper off balance. As she later told Adrian Chen, listen to this, I knew he was evil, but he was friendly, so I was especially wary, because you don't want to be seduced away from the truth by a crafty deceiver. So with that as our background, I'd like to introduce you to someone, and then I will tell you the rest of the story. I was a blue-eyed, chubby-cheeked five-year-old when I joined my family on the picket line for the first time. My mom made me leave my dolls in the minivan. I'd stand on a street corner in the heavy Kansas humidity, surrounded by a few dozen relatives, with my tiny fists clutching a sign that I couldn't read yet. Gays are worthy of death. This was the beginning. Our protest soon became a daily occurrence and an international phenomenon. And as a member of Westboro Baptist Church, I became a fixture on picket lines across the country. The end of my anti-gay picketing career, and life as I knew it, came 20 years later triggered in part by strangers on Twitter who showed me the power of engaging the other. In my home, life was framed as an epic spiritual battle between good and evil. The good was my church and its members, and the evil was everyone else. My church's antics were such that we were constantly at odds with the world, and that reinforced our otherness on a daily basis. Make a difference between the unclean and the clean, the verse says. And so we did. From baseball games to military funerals, we trekked across the country with neon protest signs in hand to tell others exactly how unclean they were and exactly why they were headed for damnation. This was the focus of our whole lives. This was the only way for me to do good in a world that sits in Satan's lap. And like the rest of my 10 siblings, I believed what I was taught with all my heart, and I pursued Westboro's agenda with a special sort of zeal. In 2009, that zeal brought me to Twitter. Initially, the people I encountered on the platform were just as hostile as I expected. They were the digital version of the screaming hordes I'd been seeing at protests since I was a kid. But in the midst of that digital brawl, a strange pattern developed. Someone would arrive at my profile with the usual rage and scorn. I would respond with a custom mix of Bible verses, pop culture references, and smiley faces. They would be understandably confused and caught off guard, but then a conversation would ensue. And it was civil, full of genuine curiosity on both sides. How had the other come to such outrageous conclusions about the world? Sometimes the conversation even bled into real life. People I'd sparred with on Twitter would come out to the picket line uh, to see me when I protested in their city. A man named David was one such person. He ran a blog called Julicious, and after several months of heated but friendly arguments online, he came out to see me at a picket in New Orleans. He brought me a Middle Eastern dessert from Jerusalem, where he lives, and I brought him kosher chocolate and held a God hates Jews sign. <laughs> There was no confusion about our positions, but the line between friend and foe was becoming blurred. We'd started to see each other as human beings, and it changed the way we spoke to one another. It took time, but eventually these conversations planted seeds of doubt in me. 
My friends on Twitter took the time to understand Westboro's doctrines, and in doing so, they were able to find inconsistencies I'd missed my entire life. Why did we advocate the death penalty for gays when Jesus said, "Let he who is without sin cast the first stone"? How could we claim to love our neighbor while at the same time praying for God to destroy them? The truth is that the care shown to me by these strangers on the internet was itself a contradiction. It was growing evidence that people on the other side were not the demons I'd been led to believe. These realizations were life-altering. Once I saw that we were not the ultimate arbiters of divine truth, but flawed human beings, I couldn't pretend otherwise. I couldn't justify our actions, especially our cruel practice of protesting funerals and celebrating human tragedy. These shifts in my perspective contributed to a larger erosion of trust in my church. And eventually, it made it impossible for me to stay. In spite of overwhelming grief and terror, I left Westboro in 2012. In those days, just after I left, the instinct to hide was almost paralyzing. I wanted to hide from the judgment of my family, who I knew would never speak to me again, people whose thoughts and opinions had meant everything to me, and I wanted to hide from the world I'd rejected for so long. People who had no reason at all to give me a second chance after a lifetime of antagonism, and yet, unbelievably, they did. The world had access to my past because it was all over the internet: thousands of tweets and hundreds of interviews, everything from local TV news to the Howard Stern show. But so many embraced me with open arms anyway. I wrote an apology for the harm I'd caused, but I also knew that an apology could never undo any of it. All I could do was try to build a new life and find a way somehow to repair some of the damage. People had every reason to doubt my sincerity, but most of them didn't. And given my history, it was more than I could have hoped for: forgiveness and the benefit of the doubt. It still amazes me. I spent my first year away from home, adrift with my younger sister, who had chosen to leave with me. We walked into an abyss, but we were shocked to find light and a way forward in the same communities we targeted for so long. David, my Jewishest friend from Twitter, invited us to spend time among a Jewish community in Los Angeles. We slept on couches in the home of a Hasidic rabbi and his wife and their four kids. The same rabbi that I'd protested three years earlier with a sign that said, "Your rabbi is a whore." We spent long hours talking about theology and Judaism and life while we washed dishes in their kosher kitchen and chopped vegetables for dinner. They treated us like family. They held nothing against us, and again, I was astonished. That period was full of turmoil, but one part I've returned to often is a surprising realization I had during that time: that it was a relief and a privilege. To let go of the harsh judgments that instinctively ran through my mind about nearly every person I saw, I realized that now I needed to learn. I needed to listen. This has been at the front of my mind lately because I can't help but see in our public discourse so many of the same destructive impulses that ruled my former church. We celebrate tolerance and diversity more than at any other time in memory, and still we grow more and more divided. We want good things, justice, equality, freedom, dignity, prosperity, but the path we've chosen looks so much like the one I walked away from four years ago. We've broken the world into us and them, only emerging from our bunkers long enough to lob rhetorical grenades at the other camp. We write off half the country as out-of-touch liberal elites or racist, misogynist bullies. No nuance, no complexity, no humanity. Even when someone does call for empathy and understanding for the other side, the conversation nearly always devolves into a debate about who deserves more empathy. And just as I learned to do, we routinely refuse to acknowledge the flaws in our positions or the merits in our opponents. Compromise is anathema. We even target people on our own side when they dare to question the party line. This path has brought us cruel sniping, deepening polarization. And even outbreaks of violence. I remember this path. It will not take us where we want to go. What gives me hope is that we can do something about this. The good news is that it's simple. 
And the bad news is that it's hard. We have to talk and listen to people we disagree with. It's hard because we often can't fathom how the other side came to their positions. It's hard because righteous indignation, that sense of certainty that ours is the right side, is so seductive. It's hard because it means extending empathy and compassion to people who show us hostility and contempt. The impulse to respond in kind is so tempting, but that isn't who we want to be. We can resist, and I will always be inspired to do so by those people I encountered on Twitter, apparent enemies who became my beloved friends. And in the case of one particularly understanding and generous guy, my husband. There was nothing special about the way I responded to him. What was special was their approach. I thought about it a lot over the past few years, and I found four things they did differently that made real conversation possible. These four steps were small but powerful, and I do everything I can to employ them in difficult conversations today. The first is, don't assume bad intent. My friends on Twitter realized that even when my words were aggressive and offensive, I sincerely believed I was doing the right thing. Assuming ill motives almost instantly cuts us off from truly understanding why someone does and believes as they do. We forget that they're a human being with a lifetime of experience that shaped their mind, and we get stuck on that first wave of anger, and the conversation has a very hard time ever moving beyond it. But when we assume good or neutral intent, we give our minds a much stronger framework for dialogue. The second is ask questions. When we engage people across ideological divides, asking questions helps us map the disconnect between our differing points of view. That's important because we can't present effective arguments if we don't understand where the other side is actually coming from, and because it gives them an opportunity to point out flaws in our positions. But asking questions serves another purpose. It signals to someone that they're being heard. When my friends on Twitter stopped accusing and started asking questions, I almost automatically mirrored them. Their questions gave me room to speak, but they also gave me permission to ask them questions and to truly hear their responses. It fundamentally changed the dynamic of our conversation. The third is stay calm. This takes practice and patience, but it's powerful. At Westboro, I learned not to care how my manner of speaking affected others. I thought my rightness justified my rudeness. Harsh tones, raised voices, insults, interruptions. But that strategy is ultimately counterproductive. Dialing up the volume and the snark is natural in stressful situations, but it tends to bring the conversation to an unsatisfactory, explosive end. When my husband was still just an anonymous Twitter acquaintance, our discussions frequently became hard and pointed, but he always refused to escalate. Instead, he would change the subject. He would tell a joke or recommend a book or gently excuse himself from the conversation. We knew the discussion wasn't over, just paused for a time to bring us back to an even keel. People often lament that digital communication makes us less civil, but this is one advantage that online conversations have over in-person ones. We have a buffer of time and space between us and the people whose ideas we find so frustrating. We can use that buffer Instead of lashing out, we can pause, breathe, change the subject, or walk away, and then come back to it when we're ready. And finally, make the argument. This might seem obvious, but one side effect of having strong beliefs is that we sometimes assume that the value of our position is or should be obvious and self-evident. That we shouldn't have to defend our positions because they're so clearly right and good. That if someone doesn't get it, it's their problem. That it's not my job to educate them. But if it were that simple, we would all see things the same way. As kind as my friends on Twitter were, if they hadn't actually made their arguments, it would have been so much harder for me to see the world in a different way. We are all a product of our upbringing, and our beliefs reflect our experiences. We can't expect others to spontaneously change their own minds. If we want change, we have to make the case for it. My friends on Twitter didn't abandon their beliefs or their principles, only their scorn. 
They channeled their infinitely justifiable offense and came to me with pointed questions tempered with kindness and humor. They approached me as a human being, and that was more transformative than two full decades of outrage, disdain, and violence. I know that some might not have the time or the energy or the patience for extensive engagement, but as difficult as it can be, reaching out to someone we disagree with is an option that is available to all of us. And I sincerely believe that we can do hard things, not just for them, but for us and our future. Escalating disgust and intractable conflict are not what we want for ourselves or our country or our next generation. My mom said something to me a few weeks before I left Westboro, when I was desperately hoping there was a way I could stay with my family. People I have loved with every pulse of my heart since even before I was that chubby-cheeked five-year-old standing on a picket line holding a sign I couldn't read. She said, "You're just a human being, my dear sweet child." She was asking me to be humble, not to question, but to trust God and my elders. But to me, she was missing the bigger picture: that we're all just human beings, that we should be guided by that most basic fact and approach one another with generosity and compassion. Each one of us contributes to the communities and the cultures and the societies that we make up. The end of this spiral of rage and blame begins with one person who refuses to indulge these destructive, seductive impulses. We just have to decide that it's going to start with us. Thank you. We're probably all subject. We're probably all subject to what the literary critic Gary Saul Morrison calls backshadowing, foreshadowing after the fact. That is the temptation to believe that we can look into the past and discern at some point which the present became inevitable. In other words, if you've ever said, "I should have seen that coming," that's what he's talking about. But it's hard to think that way, or it's hard not to think that way, by engaging with Abital in a friendly way that Phelps Roper had already set off down the road that would lead her away from Westboro Baptist Church. She started responding to others who shared Abital's skepticism about her beliefs, and some of them also proved funny or interesting or kind. She told Chen, "I was beginning to see them as human, instead of the faceless, terrible other." But it was the relationship with Abadol. When they even met in person, ironically enough, when Phelps Roper picketed a gathering that Abadol helped to organize that mattered more than any other. I'd bet a large pile of cash that thousands of people read Adrian Chen's profile of Megan Phelps Roper and said to others or themselves, "Ah, what a wonderful account of what happens when a person stops believing what she's told and learns to think for herself." But here's the really interesting and important thing. That's not at all what happened. Megan Phelps Roper didn't start quote thinking for herself. She started thinking with different people. To think independently of other human beings is impossible, and if it were possible, it would be undesirable. Thinking is necessarily thoroughly and wonderfully social. Everything you think is a response to what someone else has thought and said. And when people comment, uh, people commend someone for thinking for herself, they usually mean ceasing to sound like the people I dislike and start starting to sound more like the people I approve of. So this is David Abadol, and one of the things that's interesting is just, they're just regular people. Okay. Megan Phelps Roper is not a is not a monster. Now, her words were monstrous, but what was she doing? She's just repeating the family line, the company line. She grew up. I don't know if you heard her in the last part of the TED talk, but she's out there as a young kid holding picket signs that she doesn't read. She didn't know how to read. I don't even know what I'm holding, but here I am. It just becomes a habit. You just get you get pulled into that. So, in a sense of what do we do? And Roper gave us some some good ideas. But I'm gonna I'm gonna end this series with, with a few thoughts here. 
starting with this scripture. If you think about the four steps that she brought up, a lot of them are based off this scripture. So everyone should be quick to listen. This is really difficult because we live in a culture of being noisy, loud, and right. And so what happens is, is we just beat that drum over and over and over again. And we don't stop and think. We don't hold on and go, what is it that I'm really saying? How many of us in this culture are doing the equivalent of holding a picket sign that we don't know how to read? So when we get quick to listen, we stop. And we ponder. And we reflect. Then it says slow to speak, which may not even happen. Sometimes you don't need to talk, especially if you still don't understand. And then this last part, and slow. When you're angry, you don't think very well. I don't think very well, particularly in a a conversation. And you'll find that not a lot of things are really worth getting super angry about. So I would offer this to you in terms of what should I do. Just read this and, and think about it carefully. This is from a guy named Stephen Covey who wrote a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This was his fifth habit. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. What he's really saying is be quick to listen and slow to speak. If, if we as a culture did this, it would change things dramatically. Because usually what we do is we don't even seek to be understood, we just seek to be win and try to be clever in doing so. This is part of the issue of social media. Wow, it kind of pulls us into that, that mentality. Here's a second one. You may have to change or leave your environment. Roper did. She had to leave. This could mean a couple of things, and I'll give you an example. Social media. Social media tends to be an echo chamber. We tend to follow people who think and talk like us, and we just live in that, we live in that world. And we demonize those who don't think and act like we do, who don't toe the the company line. So you may have to, to leave it. I have left social media. I was an early adopter. Even go back to the MySpace stage. Okay, I had, I, had, I had MySpace. I was early on Facebook, early on Instagram, early on Twitter, all those things. And I've left them all for a variety of reasons. And one of the things that I have noticed is life just, it's less noisy. There's a lot of, there's a lot of emotion. And again, this, is, this was my choice. But I just thought, you know what? I, I don't need it. And so you leave. Okay. Even though these are very popular in 2018, you, you can opt out. It's okay. It's actually quite freeing in some ways. Now here's another one. You may have to change or leave your friend group. One of the reasons why I kept using Mean Girls throughout this series, because it's a great example, albeit a comical one, but it's a great example of how our thinking gets changed, our actions are influenced by the people that are around, and we don't even know it. Hence the line towards the end of the movie where Katie goes, have I become the queen bee? Like, I, that was never my intent, but here I am. How did that happen? And now what do I do with that? How do I use that? Okay. Scripture's really clear. You become like the people you hang out with. I've, I've changed friend groups twice in my life, once in junior high and once in college. Difficult both times, don't regret it at all. Because I realize when I'm around these people, I act and think differently and poorly. And I'm not strong enough when I'm around them to be different. So the, the problem is me. I, I, gotta, I gotta get out. I gotta opt out. It was, it was challenging, but it was very freeing. You may have to do that. Cultural affiliations with political, we heard a, a faith uh, story with Megan Phelps Roper, but think about this with me here. So politically, talking politics is risky business. It's big business. 
So you got Republicans and Democrats. Currently, the, the GOP is is struggling because their their wagons getting hitched to, to Donald Trump. Right? Now this is not about Donald Trump, right? but understand the thinking that goes on to it. So Trump is a polarizing figure, to to say the least. But during the campaign. So this came up, and there's one word on here that I'm going to point out. But if you, you've not read this, so this is Hillary Clinton. So you could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables, right? She's speaking to, a, to an audience of her supporters. They're racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. So it's just sort of a catch-all. Now here's the key word. Now if you feel like she's talking to you, Typically in the culture, what's the response? This. Oh yeah? Well, let's talk about your candidate. So here's a short list of scandals. And what's the key word? Yeah, but we're deplorable? And then where does it go? Oh yeah? Well, your guy apparently is a big fan. And on and on it goes. Oh yeah? And so what we do as people, because of who they voted for, we assume, oh, so if you voted for them, or if you show any interest in them, or any sympathy towards them, you must then be like this. And you're terrible. Period. And it happens so quickly. So in, in, in my junior high world, I get, I get two kids who are, who are fighting and who've said mean things to each other and are, and are treating each other badly. And uh, I'll sit down with them. I say, when you go to school, you come home at the end of the day, what kind of day do you want to have? And they say things like, well, you know, I want to hang with my friends, have some fun, you know, and not have too much homework. Like, you know, just, just come and have a good day. I said, do you want people to like you? Yeah. You like hanging with your friends? Yeah. Okay. And I said, well, I, I asked this other person the same question. And do you know what they said? Same thing. Yet you two are doing the very things that make that impossible. Tell me about that. And a lot of it is, well, you know, I heard. And they said, okay, did you really hear that? Or is that just what people are saying happened? I, I mean, I don't, I don't know, I guess. So here's where I'm going with this. You start with commonalities. Okay? You just humanize people. See, when we treat people like the terrible other, they lose their humanity. They, you lose what's in, what's in common. Okay? Think about what would happen if we humanized each other. If we didn't hold people to their sins and mistakes. I mean, it's kind of a small school. And you might be going, well, it's a small school, so people know everything. There are about 350 students, 9 through 12, at Bellevue Christian. My graduating class was 660 students. That's just my senior class. My high school had 2,200 students with three grades. I can go to this day through my yearbook and tell you who slept with who. Because it was common knowledge at my school. So you may go, oh, small school. It's a human being problem. It's not a small school problem. But here's where I think the small school problem kicks in. Because we know things about people and we hold it over them. And so rather than giving grace towards other and, and frankly judging ourselves, being frustrated with ourselves, trying to get the, the speck of sawdust out of our own eye, we create the terrible other, and I can't believe they would do that. They're so bad. Can you believe it? I'm never talking to them again. And we completely miss the point of the gospel which is that we're all sinners saved by grace and that we all are in need 
of redemption. We're all in need of restoration. What does is, what is Matthew 5 say in the Beatitudes? Blessed are the peacemakers. How do you want people to treat you? You go and treat them that way and do it first. When you've blown it, when you've made a mistake, what do you want? You want people to treat you with compassion. You want people to treat you with grace. You want people to go, I get it. Let's, let's figure it out together. So how, are we, how are we doing with that? And I don't mean this as a, as a, as a guilt trip. But just think about, think about our school culture. Think about what could be if we did this, if we just humanize people. You know, at the end of the day, everybody wants the same thing. And everybody's vulnerable, and everybody's struggling, and everybody's just trying to figure it out. Are, are we being peacemakers? Are we being healers and helpers? Or are we being judge, juries, and executioners? And this is, this is what turned Phelps Roper around. She's like, these people were nice to me. The rabbi, who I called a whore three years ago, has me in his house and is cooking with me and eating with me with his wife and with his kids, and we're doing life together. We're talking about real stuff in friendship. Blessed are the peacemakers. All right. So again, we, we, just, we come back to this. This is really just a call to, to live this out in person, electronically. Is our thinking guided by this or is it guided by the cultural trend which is guilt by association and judgment by association? This idea of do not conform. You know this verse, but just read it slowly. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Taking every thought making it captive to Christ. Am I thinking about people in a Christ-like way and am I treating them accordingly? Am I being a healer or am I being a judge? Am I being a helper or am I being a critic? Am I being a Christian or am I being a hypocrite? And we have to renew our minds with these thoughts all the time. You can't do it once and go, I'm 